Welcome to the India Fintech Diaries, the only podcast focused exclusively on the Indian fintech market. I am Elroy and I am Himan. In each episode, we dive into the latest trends, ideas, innovations, business models and personalities that are shaping India's fintech landscape. We also invite amazing guests who are innovators and industry players that are driving the change that is helping make financial services more modern, innovative and inclusive in India. Come join us as we explore the changing landscape of fintech in India. Hi everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of India Fintech Diaries. I'm your co-host Hemant and this is the show where we discuss the latest trends in Indian fintech, speak to some amazing guests from the industry and dive deep into specific fintech themes. And I'm your co-host Elroy. In today's episode, we discuss the exciting new space of buy now pay later and digital credit with Krishnan Vishwanathan. CEO and co-founder of Kisht. Welcome to India Fintech Diaries, Krishnan. Uh, my pleasure, Elroy. My pleasure, uh, Himan. Look forward to an exciting discussion. Krishnan, you've had quite the journey from starting out in semiconductors and then transitioning on to becoming a management consultant with McKinsey and now running a fintech. Talk to us a little about yourself and Kisht, the company that you helped found. Uh, sure. Just a little bit about my background. I'm an electrical engineering graduate from IIT Delhi. Been a very, very keen, nerdy technology enthusiast even from my younger days, whether it was building a transistor when I was in school to, you know, looking at uh, television sets and helping repair them with my dad. But just going forward, you know, engineering came naturally to me. And, uh, you know, I was very, very keen to uh, be a part of any latest tech innovation. And that's what took me to Silicon Valley back in, you know, 98, 2000. I was part of multiple startups, largely working in the theme of digital signal processing. You know, it's almost looks like a different era, but, you know, cell phones were about audio communication at one point in time and, you know, video and digital was just uh, becoming mainstream at the time. And digital signal processing was key area of innovation that I worked on, uh, multiple patents to my name. That journey which I undertook was core to a lot of the things that I am today, whether how does technology solve day-to-day problem, how do I think about technology from, you know, making people's lives better, right? And that's that's kind of the underlying theme that has, uh, while I may have jumped industries, that underlying theme of technology usage is what has stayed permanent with me through the course of my professional journey. Somewhere uh, eight or nine years into my technology career, I, I really wanted to make a foray into the business side of things that incentivized me, inspired me to do an MBA. Uh, that was also the time when, you know, the India growth story was really taking shape. That was back in 2007, 2008. Right. And there was a, very, very keen enthusiasm for me to come back and start something on the uh, business side of things back in India. And management consulting kind of came naturally to me, right? It's, it's a step in towards someone who's been in the technology domain all his life, trying to get a footage into what's, what creates value, how does business work? And, uh, you know, just the transitioning into management consulting seemed a very, very natural inflection point in my career. You know, joined uh, McKinsey. Can't think of a better grounding in, in business than uh, McKinsey. It just happened that I was part of the financial services practice, right, uh, when I was at McKinsey. But if I think a little bit back, those five, six years that I spent in McKinsey, that those five, six years looking at real problems that banks, NBFCs, life insurance companies, asset management companies are facing and having that background, deep tech background in technology and helping me think through how do you address those problems has Ultimately, what has been the inspiration for me to start Cash? So at, at one level, I would say where I am today, what Cash is today is a culmination of all the varied experiences I've had. But also at the core of it has been, you know, my my innate fascination for technology mm. and, the, and whatever the technology can do. Just uh, jumping to Cash, this is a company we launched uh, back in 2015. Uh, there were two founders. There is uh, me and then uh, Ranveer Singh. Uh, both of us were colleagues at McKinsey and Company. He is also an IIT Bombay graduate, a mechanical engineer, uh, MBA from IIM Bangalore. You know, one of the, the core things that, you know, that stuck us, you know, just staring on our face when we were doing financial services, uh, management mm. consulting, you know, was the fact that there is the majority of the Indian population and that majority extends to as high as at a household level, 60, 65% of the population. That is outside of the financial services mainstream, right? Whether you think about credit, right. whether you think about payments uh, or insurance. And, you know, the, the journey of this started by saying, how do I think about technology to bring this majority of the segment into the mainstream of financial services in India? And credit was something that I understood. Credit was something that my co-founder understood. And, and Kish, the germination was saying, I want to find a way to 
serve the formal credit need of this segment, right? The new to credit segment, the lower income segment, the self-employed segment, the people who make income anywhere from 10,000 to 40,000 rupees, but not as a standard pay slip, but, but it's like irregular, sometimes part cash, part bank. How do I address it and, and think about data and tech in a very, very fundamentally different way to address that opportunity. So that's in a nutshell who we are, what Kish is. We like to believe we are providers of formal credit solution for this underserved segment in India and, uh, you know, our own small step into making a majority of India part of the credit mainstream. Thanks a lot, Krishan, for that uh, very interesting introduction to yourself and Kish. Now, let me just jump into the topic for today. So when I first heard about uh, buy now, pay later, this was, I think, in 2016, uh, when Klarna was just about getting this concept into Western Europe after having very successfully popularized the concept in Scandinavia. Now, you just cut to about five years later since that point, buy now, pay later or BNPL as it's now called, is actually poised to reach about $600 billion in gross merchandise value by 2025. But in spite of this and being around for so many years, what's really mystified me over the years is what exactly constitutes a BNPL. So what's your take on how BNPL should be defined? Sure. Uh, no, you're right, uh, uh, Elroy. There are multiple definitions of uh, buy now, pay later. The simple definition that I would uh, use for buy now, pay later would be any form of payment instrument that can be used at a you know, as, at the checkout point, whether it's a physical merchant or an e-commerce merchant. Right. That delays the payment for that product or service to a later date. Okay. Now that uh, delayed payment could be a one-time payment within a certain duration. It could be payment and installment. So it's a, it's kind of a wider definition. But for me, buy now, pay later essentially is how do I delay the payment for an instrument that I'm purchasing for a product or service that I'm purchasing today uh, at a merchant outlet. And I think even within that, Krishnan, there are two uh, distinct models that start coming up, right? One is the delayed uh, payment model that you just mentioned, where you defer the entire payment, say, by 15 days uh, after a certain period of time, right? A second model looks at converting those payments into installments. Uh, these could be zero interest installments, or these could be uh, installments that are paid out, uh, say, over six, over six months and so on. So if you deconstruct uh, the BNPL model, it could be looked at as an unsecured loan that's dispersed for relatively short periods of time, say as compared to a personal loan, right? But BNPL also brings in certain elements of merchant acquisition because at some level as a BNPL service provider, you may need to do uh, merchant integrations, uh, ensure that you are there at the right merchants. And uh, in some cases, this also in looks at uh, issuing a, re a revolving line for cases where you would want the person to keep using your product. So can you help demystify the business model for our listeners, uh, maybe touch on who are the key stakeholders and also on how BNPL companies typically make money? Sure. Uh, no, happy to do that, Elroy. Let me start by, you know, the consumer value proposition, right? Yeah. The BNPL product has, you know, two fundamental value proposition to the customer. There is the convenience proposition and then there is the credit proposition. Right. Uh, both are equally important and at least my take is any company that is trying to create a business model out of BNPL need to service both of the propositions together. Otherwise, it's a very uh, narrow uh, way of looking from a consumer standpoint, right? Because right. what is convenience, say a 500 rupee purchase for me, that same customer may have a credit need for a 5000 rupee purchase as well. So yeah. if I take a consumer mindset, there are two fundamental propositions, the convenience part of it and the credit part of it. And one needs to solve for both of them. Now, where where does this need germinate from? I think it's important to understand how the payments industry has evolved, right? Yeah. Uh, from a from a checkout payment standpoint, you know, the biggest provider of solution has been the credit card industry. And yeah. what has been the norm globally, and I think has only been magnified manifold in the context of India, is that the credit card industry has been, you know, has had two fundamental drawbacks. One, just the way the technology, the the entire, you know, the payments value chain from payment processing to the interchange to the issuers, it's it's not been very light on the operation side. So there has been a lot of multiple stakeholders. The the unified view has not been there. That has uh, put a cost overhead on the entire credit card uh, uh, value chain. Yeah. There is also the other need, and and you know, it's it's probably to some extent losing this view on customer centricity and you know transparency where the entire fees and you know fee structure of a credit card has either deliberately been or uh, for whatever reason has been very opaque to the customer yeah so there has been a loss of the trust factor which comes from credit card i know capital one is one institution that i'm very proud of i think made some headway in trying to dismantle 
uh, some of these uh, lacunas in the credit card offering while being in the same state. But fundamentally, credit card has faced roadblocks on both of these parameters. And that's where, you know, the BNPL uh, offering kind of uh, became uh, via media. People are looking for credit card light solution, uh, which is built around convenience and transparency. And and yet being able to solve for the basic needs that they have. I think the other aspect of, uh, you know, why uh, the uh, the credit need came up, again, the credit card has always been seen as a uh, affluent or at least a lower affluent uh, offering, right? Hmm. And uh, when you think about the growing segment from a uh, from a consumer standpoint, that is a segment that is saturated, maybe growing at a, at a healthy pace, maybe at a macro GDP growth rate, right, for globally. Yeah. But really the opportunity landscape for them is, are the set of people who are uh, one rung on the economic ladder, but you know the the scope for economic growth uh, is significantly larger, and that's where you know that's the second. This is this is where the the credit solution, the credit proposition becomes far more relevant, where credit cards simply have not penetrated to that segment, right? Uh, and yeah. and uh, BNPL uh, obviously becomes the focal point for these segment to actually get a solution which didn't exist for them till date, right? So that's that's just looking at it from a consumer standpoint, offering convenience and transparency, and then uh, offering uh, the credit proposition. And I'll come back to the credit proposition, right? How do you think about credit? It's hmm. ultimately it's a risk uh, a business model. Yeah. See, the other other big stakeholder in this is obviously the merchant, right? Right. And uh, if you if you again think about the merchant, you know, uh, funnily so, just like consumer. There is actually a different economic strata in within the merchant landscape also. Yep. There are merchants who are on the high end side, probably the retail margins are significantly larger and any transaction processing cost was a small part of doing business for them, right? And then there is a much larger, both from a quantum standpoint and if you look at the gross merchandising, all of them accumulated, significantly larger where, you know, uh, merchants that are working at a retail margin of anywhere from 3% to 10% range, right? Where the transaction yeah. processing cost uh, becomes a very, very important factor. Now, when you marry the two, the second important stakeholder is a merchant. And for merchant, the important aspect of any payment offering falls in two buckets, right? One is obviously the extent of coverage. If, if 100 people come to my uh, doorstep, whether it's on the checkout page or, you know, walking into my outlet, uh, is there a payment service available for them for 90, 100 of them versus only a small segment, right? And uh, if you again go back to the credit card uh, proposition, the coverage globally as well as in India has never been that mainstream, right? In India, particularly, it's in the units of uh, percentage. Yeah. The other aspect is again, once again, it's the cost to it, right? The credit card interchange fee, the MDR, the merchant discount rate that they pay, yeah. how is anywhere from one and a half percent to as high as five six percent, right? Depending on the instrument, whether it's a Infinia card, American Express, or uh, a more mass market credit card, right? Yeah. And there comes a player like, you know, buy now, pay later service provider, a very, very lean uh, architecture, you know, literally short circuiting some of the uh, payment system value chain of interchange issuers, processors, and saying, here is an offering. Number one, it covers a larger segment of your customers. And hey, by the way, where it was costing you on an average two and a half, three percent we will charge you a lower number, right? The discount could be, it could be lower by 30%, 50% or even larger, depending on the uh, business model of the BNPL player. And that's that's the second aspect of, uh, you know, stakeholder value proposition. Yeah. And, you know, unless you address both of them, uh, a BNPL value proposition will always remain uh, incomplete. Also, Krishna, from a merchant perspective, right? I think there's another very important factor that you should also consider as to why merchants are being attracted towards BNPL. So one of the problems that merchants typically face is what's called as checkout friction or cart abandonment. Sure. So let's say, for example, uh, someone is shopping online and this is more true for online shopping than offline shopping. There are several cases where a customer does not remember his card number, doesn't have the card handy, so doesn't enter it. That's number one, right? So that entire transaction is lost. In other cases, uh, you may have, and this is especially true of India, right? Where uh, you may have additional uh, security measures put in like two-factor authentication or infamous OTP in India where the OTP is never delivered to the phone, so they eventually the customer loses interest. Yeah. So one of the key propositions BNPL providers have also been putting forward to merchants is, A, we'll solve this friction problem for you, and therefore you'll also see maybe up to 25% more sales, just because folks have uh, an easier way to pay at uh, checkout. Yeah, 
No, so so Elroy, I think uh, uh, you're right. There is the the friction proposition as well, and friction you're talking about at the transaction point, right? I think that that's is right. A second part of the friction, which is also say a customer walks in to my checkout page. Yeah. Can I actually onboard that customer for the buy now pay later person yep. at the point of transaction itself, right? Something that is almost impossible to envisage for a traditional player, uh, but for a buy now pay later guy who is actually API integrated very deeply with the e-commerce player, that is something you can do. So it's it's friction both for uh, easy enrollment and onboarding, but also subsequent yeah. payments. Correct, right? correct. So, so you are absolutely right. Uh, the only caveat I will say from a friction standpoint, particularly on the transaction page, see both elements. Let's talk about the first element, which is to say that the number of hops, right? Yeah. Uh, there are e-commerce players who are trying to work more closely and more deeply with banks and credit card providers to cut short that time, right? Whether, you know, the Amazon pay directly hosting Correct. some of these. So those are, I think, aspects that credit card service providers are trying to short circuit. And as far as two-factor authentication is coming, let me play it back saying that I, we as a company are implementing in our BNPL solution two-factor authentication, right? So, I mean, it's just adding a layer of security ourselves. Yeah, uh, but you know, I understand your larger theme that there is a there is a uh, the friction proposition as well to the merchant. You know, if you ask me at the core of it, the convenience and credit proposition is what will drive the long term sustainable growth of this. And okay. those propositions are uh, at least a larger bank and credit card service provider will find it more difficult to offer. You know, just given the technology structure they have, the larger organization, the organizational DNA, to be able to come down to a lean proposition that makes such offers actually value creating is not an easy step for them, right? Uh, yeah. And that's at least that's my proposition that at least my view that it's going to be more convenience and credit and lower cost while covering a larger segment for the merchant themselves. Understood. Krishan, that's that's very interesting. But as we discuss the global uh, setup or global landscape that we see in BNPL, it has been very interesting that the market in India itself has become highly competitive with players like Simple, Lazy Pay, Zest Money, Pay Later, Buy CSA Bank, even Amazon jumping into it. So it'd be very interesting to understand from you, how do you see the uptake of BNPL has been in India? You know, you talked about Klarna back in 2016. BNPL in India also originated around that time only, the early versions of BNPL, right? And if I talk about the KISS journey, we had a BNPL offering right from 2016 as well. So to that extent, BNPL in India has, uh, maybe it's uh, it's also a five-year-old journey. And uh, in those five years, there have been phases where, you know, BNPL from a value proposition and growth perspective has been muted. But off late, there has been a tremendous uptake. And to a large extent, the reasons for BNPL growing has, to some extent, the innovation has really become mainstream, but to a large, but to a larger extent, what's happening in the broader macro, right? Uh, even before the COVID happened, right. the mainstreaming of uh, whether it's the India stack or ra- right from whether it's KYC solutions, the UPI, the wallet penetration, you know, the digital mainstreaming of the segment that I talked about for whom the BNPL really is uh, the core proposition has been one of the biggest flip in terms of the growth of BNPL in India. Now, when you overlay that with whatever happened as part of COVID, you know, digital payments, social distancing, and the need to swap out digital payments for cash on delivery, BNPL has really taken off in the last one, one and a half years. And this is not, this is not a one-time growth that we're talking about. BNPL, at least my belief is, in uh, any which way you look at the data, will become a large part of the e-commerce transaction. Uh, my own take is that it will become 10 past, 10% of the overall e-commerce transaction in another two to three years. And the need for that convenience and credit is not going away anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Um, so the hyper competitive nature of startups trying to address is, is just uh, a reflection of the opportunity landscape, which is, which exists out there in the market. That said, uh, you know, ultimately the game of BNPL will come down to two things. One, whether you are able to provide that convenience and credit proposition while taking on lower costs. Right? We've been talking about the front-end business model, but the front-end business model does not necessarily translate into creating value for the organization as well. So for all the 10, 15, and including case, right, to take mm-hmm. that BNPL scale to where all of us are today to say a 10x number, while ensuring that uh, it continues to create value, generate uh, profits for the organization, it has to solve for you know, the risk that underlies a fundamental business model built on uh, BNPL. And that is something that organizations will have to solve for. And I think many of them are doing it right now, including. 
yeah and krishnan i understand and we understand that you provide bnpl products but you also provide other retail credit products and with a company like you you are very very close to the consumer behavior right because this credit is being used for certain purposes it would be very very interesting to understand both from the bnpl aspect but in addition to that even from the retail credit aspect what are the different consumer behavior patterns on trends that you see what are they buying who is buying uh, has it changed in a, in the last couple of years absolutely i think the one of the most fascinating parts for us as an organization the learning curve is what is this credit used for right? right for the longest time and and you know just going back to how we started as a journey in cash we started more on the consumption side of the credit opportunity and when i say consumption side uh, the core proposition was checkout financing for us whether it's with physical merchants or e-commerce merchants over time we have broadened our product portfolio to provide all kinds of credit solutions right even unsecured personal loans but while sticking our core focus on the same segment that i alluded to right uh, which is on the lower mass market due to credit side people who are somewhere in the 25 to 35 years of age bracket early on in their credit journey and at one level you can oversimplify the segment right like i talked about uh, whether it's uh, the credit profile of the customer the age demographic uh, the employment demographic but if you actually look at the needs part of it it's really very very fascinating right the need for credit solution falls in you know three or four buckets bucket number one which everybody understands and appreciate is the consumption part but even within the consumption part there's a discretionary spending and there's a non discretionary spending correct i think the less understood and under appreciated part of credit need is also the business need right whenever people think about credit for business people start thinking about 3 lakh credit 5 lakh mm. credit 3 crore credit right 30 to 40% of india indian households are self employed households whose uh, revenues for the month would be like 2 lakhs or 3 lakhs right and within that the working capital will be 30 40000 for them the credit need is actually more in the bulk bulk pack of 5000 to 15000 or 20000 so the other under appreciated need of consumers is how does even a small ticket credit further the self employed the business needs of a self employed customer and then there is obviously the third aspect of the need which is uh, which is around emergency whether it's a medical emergency whether it's a one time need around education or vacation which is which falls in the third bucket and fourth uh, last of it is the convenience proposition which is to say that if i can delay my payment why should i pay for it today right? right and and you know addressing all of those four needs is important because it's the same consumer who's wearing all of those four hats at different points in time and for different needs and therefore for any pro, any you know organization at least it's true for cash you know wearing all of those multiple hats and therefore ensuring that both their product stack as well as their product offering is able to cater to all of these segments with different features modularity flexibility uh, becomes very very important from a consumer value proposition and uh, uh, this is just a very interesting facet if you ask any credit uh, company consumer credit company you you know you largely find that the salaried people is a large uh, largest percentage right for us Correct. it is uh, 72% of our customers are self employed um, mm. and so that's just a manifestation of the fact that you know that's where the real need is at least for the segment we're talking about that's a that's a brilliant segue krishnan for me for the next question because you are serving this specific segment which is the mass market segment and predominantly self employed and this is a segment Uh, from which traditional organizations have stayed away saying that it is a riskier segment maybe the profitability is going to not going to be there and that means when you decided to serve that particular segment i think credit scoring or evaluating the credit worthiness of this customer base becomes extremely important so can you provide us some insights into how do you do that sure so you are right uh, i think you know the the fundamental basis for assigning credit to the customer is obviously going to be whether he is capable of paying back right correct and uh, when you go historically how this was actually done uh, what is called as the underwriting function of uh, financial institutions mm. you know the the basis would be how do i assess his income and when you when you go one level deeper the way they would assess is either look at the bank statement and look at credits salary credits or take pay slip and look at the pay slip right and then you would overlay that with saying that you know if he can earn uh, 1 lakh then maybe he can pay emis of 20000 it's a five year loan so on and so forth right now when you take that kind of underwriting process architecture and say that this is how i want to serve this segment it it breaks at uh, two levels uh, level number 1 is you know the income does it face its bank right that's that's just 
point number one. Not all of his income, right? If you take a driver, or even if you take, you know, a lot of the helpers, right. uh, household helpers, or even uh, store helpers, uh, part cash, part uh, banking, and so there is a uncertainty in terms of whether banking credits are the real. Uh, this thing. Second, the, just the process is very document heavy, right? It's just right. supremely document heavy. And uh, uh, even if you are able to take 10 days, look at 10 different documents and say, maybe I'll give a loan. I mean, you spent more than you can ever earn from that. Mm. And, you know, for the starting point for us was, what is that set of data points and not just data points, right? digital markers that I can use, number one, that can serve as a proxy for this customer, a uh, proxy income for this customer. And whether I can process that real time to take a sound assessment, whether he's credit worthy or not. And, you know, this has not been a journey that uh, we uh, cracked two months or three months. I think we were lucky enough early on in our journey that uh, we had uh, two very talented people join our company. One who's, you know, very, very strong in big data and the other person is very strong in statistics, ML and AI. Uh, but, you know, even with that kind of talent, it took us three, four, five, six loan cycles to really understand how do these alternate data play a role. But at the the bedrock of it is, you know, we gather a lot of data on the customers. We do lookalike analysis. Uh, we do what is called a gradient boosting model. You know, these are all various statistical techniques that is able to process gigabytes of data in real time and ultimately able to decipher bad credit person versus a good credit person. This model that's quite proprietary is essentially uh, what has helped us, you know, create long term sustainable uh, value proposition in this domain for us. Understood. Understood. On that point, uh, Krishnan, we have initially alluded uh, for our listeners that Kisht provides not only BNPL products, but there are other retail products that are provided by Kisht. I think it's a good point to now dive deep and try to understand what are the different products that Kisht offers uh, sure. to its customers. Uh, Hemant, if you give me a little bit of translation, I think one of the elements that I wanted to talk about from the credit perspective, the prior mm-hmm. question, yeah. is, you know, one of the things that uh, many people feel the the journey is won or lost in deciding who to give to credit to. And while that may be true, and that's, I'm talking about credit assessment and credit underwriting, while that may be true for, you know, a more aware customer and larger ticket size loans, you know, when it comes to the segment we are operating in, the journey of the customer post giving the loan, the engagement, the awareness, you know, the collections platform also is an important aspect. And there's a, uh, one of the things that Kisht has done historically is that, you know, we've used data and data analytics fundamentally in a very, very different way in seeing how we engage with our customer, make him aware. And that's a that's another important aspect of, you know, having a value proposition across the entire value chain. We are not a platform, we are a risk-taking institution. And therefore, that second aspect becomes equally important for us uh, as we think about catering to this segment. I just thought I'll, I'll uh, also allude to that. Perfect. Now, Perfect. Uh, coming to the question that uh, you talked about, see, uh, Abed, the core proposition that we have is what is called as a line of credit solution. So the easiest way, you know, there are two ways customers can discover us. They can either discover us at a partner platform, merchant platform, but also more easily by just downloading our app and going through a very simple process of, you know, ascertaining whether they can uh, get a credit limit for us. When when a customer comes to us, we don't give them a loan. We give them a limit. The limit could be as low as 3,000, 4,000 rupees, could be as high as 50,000 rupees. And once that limit is done, you know, how that limit translates into solving for the various credit needs of the customer really depends on the needs of the customer. So the, the offers are a subset of, you know, the limit. So he could go to a merchant outlet, buy a 500 rupee purchase cart and say, I want a buy now pay later solution that I'll pay back in 30 days. He could buy a 20,000 rupee mobile and say, I'll take a four month installment and pay at so and so rates. But he can also, you know, tap into the same line of credit and say that I want so much personal loan. The loan actually goes into the bank account. We try to understand the need for the personal uh, loan from the customer. But, you know, so there are multiple credit solutions. But within the overall, you know, at a very boring level, I would say it's the light of credit. We mm-hmm. understand how much the customer is capable of repaying. And once we know, we understand that customer to that extent, we can use that limit for any other need. So to that extent, we are, you can call us a digital EMI solution provider or a digital pay later solution provider, right? That's, that's who we are. Uh, we also provide insurance solutions. Now the insurance solutions are more an adjunct, uh, to our core credit offering. And that's, uh, only because we feel that anybody who takes a loan from us has other needs, particularly in the COVID days, we realized that medical insurance is 
something that has not reached the uh, you know the segment that we are catering to and therefore we partnered with our uh, with insurance companies to provide that offering as well uh, so these are the two core offerings we have a line of credit that offers bnpl checkout financing and personal loans as well as insurance uh, uh, largely for medical uh, medical needs got it got it got it so uh, krishan also can you walk us through through a typical customer journey so if i want to take this line of credit from kisht what are the different journeys that as a customer i'll go through sure so uh, there like i said the origination of the journey could be uh, either at our partner merchant site or downloading our app right both of those happen uh, very identically uh, when you download our app you know we'll ask basic uh, information from you your name your age uh your employment status and declared income uh what we uh, do as part of the journey is also uh do the kyc real time you know being an integrated nbfc uh, we do we are allowed to do okyc we have, we are integrated with uh, udai for uh, enabling the okyc solutions on our platform but there are multiple other you know integrations we have we have direct bank integrations to for those customers who are able to share uh their bank statement with us digitally we are, they are able to uh, do that with us we are integrated with nsdl uh, to do a pan verification we are integrated with you know multiple utility companies so one of the aspect that we find very interesting is you know even a customer who doesn't have a very formal income the fact that he pays electricity utility bill consistently of certain amount say 2000 rupees a month tells me a lot about the income capacity of that customer right so there is again integration so these are all digital integrations by the way so the, there is not a single piece of paper not a single piece of document that becomes part but you know there's a series of steps that we take the customer it takes the customer anywhere from 2 to 3 minutes to go through the process hmm. at the end of the process the offer is made to the customer this is your line of credit you know uh, all the transparency in terms of you know what what does taking the line of credit mean he just has to click that line of credit right and it's active uh in the very next step he can say i want so much into my bank account he clicks it he gets the money in the bank account within a second he can then go to any of our partner website he will discover that kisht is uh, available as a uh, checkout thing he can just say i want to make 3000 rupees i want to use kisht click the sale is made so mm-hmm. once that line of account is activated everything is at a single click disposal for him for for him and this entire process uh, is just to reiterate instant and 100% paperless not only not only the origination aspect but you know going forward uh, going beyond that even the repayment solutions you know multiple integrations whether you know he want he can set up a mandate with us if he wants he can he can choose to pay using any of the multiple payment gateways we are upi integrated again you know just he can just go to the app and there are thousand repayment options available to him he can choose any of the repayment options and uh, with a single click he is able to repay back uh, whatever loan he took from us so that's that's essentially the customer journey mm-hmm. i think what really excites the customer to us has been you know number one uh, the convenience and transparency but also the ease of use right you know that he knows that this credit is available at a fingertip for him so he may not use it today there are so many customers who would take the line of credit and then two months down the line three months down the line when the need comes they know that they can go back to case click that and you know get that uh, line activated and that is that is the core proposition uh, we offer to our customers got it got it and uh, krishan the particular category that you are serving and i'm very very sure that building a product and scaling business for this category is, is not very simple and definitely basically building business in india is not very simple <laughs> so you would have faced multiple challenges in in scaling up this business can you walk us through some of those challenges and how did you get around that challenges i mean i wish there was one big challenge i think there were thousand big challenges so picking yeah. and choosing the big challenges uh, is not going to be easy but uh, you know uh, at the heart of it the biggest challenge was you know the, just convincing the the investor community to say that you know this segment can actually be served i know this sounds very cliche but whether it's convincing a bank as we think about taking a debt line uh, to online or even you know speaking to equity investors and say you know there is a value proposition while catering to this segment is not easy to do because it's it's a capital hungry investment right you need to put money you need to lose money before you understand whether the credit model really works or not um and therefore there is a little bit of a chicken and egg problem which says that till i lose some money i cannot uh, i cannot actually show uh, this thing. so there is there's a business model aspect of it which is you know just fortifying your credit model making it super robust 
while ensuring that there is uh, uh, there is uh, uh, while you have the capital for it. The technology aspect of it is supremely supremely tough, right? Today we are talking about hundreds of APIs, right? Yeah. Every merchant has his own uh, set of needs, uh, whether it's an e-commerce player, whether it's a physical merchant. There are, you know, like I talked about, there are thousands of credit needs of the customer, right? Some people want a flexible payment options. People want bi-weekly payment options. And, uh, and there are some people who say, I will repay in 20 days, even though, you know, this is my interest rate per month because I repaid in 20 days. I don't, I want you to charge only two third of that. So there are also, there is also the technology aspect to say that how do I make my platform super modular and super flexible to cater to all of the needs of my two important stakeholders, the consumer and borrower at one level and the merchant at the second level. And the second aspect has, is probably where today we are differentiated because we did not take shortcuts to begin with. That made our go-to-market journey slightly elongated because we refused to do any band-aid solution. We really thought, you know, ground up, this is the most modular platform we have to create. But then building all of those API integrations uh, while keeping these this modularity sacrosanct has not been an easy aspect, right? But, you know, while all of those challenges are uh, are something that we address, I, I do want to say that, you know, the, the entire industry technology framework and the policy framework that has evolved in India in the last five years has truly helped, right? And, and I don't know if if a lot of the success you are seeing in the fintech platform would have been possible if those had not taken shape in parallel to you know innovation happening within the fintech industry. Yeah, Krishan, now I'm starting to feeling like that you are able to read my mind because that was my next point. There's a lot happening as far as policies and digital infra is concerned in India. And in fact, for example, account aggregator is coming in, Oken is coming in. In fact, we did two episodes, one each on uh, account aggregator and Oken. What do you see the impact of uh, these digital infra or policies will have uh, on this market space? You know, immense. Uh, both of these will have immense impact. Uh, ultimately, I feel that, you know, the raw data should be a utility. A utility where, you know, the access while guarding privacy, while ensuring security of that data should be mainstream at the lowest possible cost to all of the industry players. And to that extent, both OKIN and account aggregators are step in the right direction. And, uh, you know, once you make, once you make uh, utility, once you make data as a utility, the availability of raw data as utility, then the real differentiator that, you know, the industry participants can do is in terms of the AI and ML intelligence. It's in, it's uh, value proposition in terms of products offering to the customer, uh, the centricity, the delight factor in terms of UI, you know, those becomes far more relevant, uh, from a market participant standpoint, but it's the the first step towards you know making this as a the, the data availability as a low cost utility is absolutely paramount that brings down the overall cost of transaction ultimately you know that will make pricing of both bnpl and any credit solution cheaper to the borrower and that will only expand the overall market in india brilliant krishan so you have built a great product so if someone wants to know more about kist or actually wants to uh Take a, take a loan or a great line from you, how do they go about it? The easiest way to understand us is to just go to our website, right? www.kesh.com. All of our offerings, information uh, is all present there. Uh, obviously, if you want to become part of the journey and avail of the credit, the easiest way to do it would be to download our app. Uh, I would encourage uh, Elroy, you and Hemant both to undertake the same journey. And uh, uh, it's a very, very simple process, two to uh, three minutes. Like I said, all of the things that I talked about in terms of ease of use, the convenience, the transparency will all become clear as part of the journey. Excellent, Krishna. So I'll include those details in our show note as well. And sure. before we head out, we do have some international audience. And I thought it would be good to tell them that Kisht is a Hindi word for installments. So basically, the company name embodies what what the offering or the product is. Thanks a ton, Krishnan, for taking out time and speaking with us and shining some light both on BNPL and the great work that you are doing in the market as far as retail credit is concerned and specifically for the mass market segment, which really struggled to access uh, credit. My pleasure, Heyman. Uh, thank you, everyone. That's it from India Fintech Diaries for this week. Do keep an eye out on our website, indiafintechdiaries.com for exclusive companion content on topics discussed on the show. And until next time, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.